to totally change your perspective. Very quickly evolving world. And you've heard already that there's VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That's part of the world, much more than there used to be. You also know that we're living in an age of accelerating change with the emphasis not on the change, but on the acceleration. And we're seeing this anger between the have-nots and the haves, between all sorts of people in the world. There's always been some of that, but now it's technologically enabled. And so we have to deal with all these issues. Given all that going on in the world, what do we ask of our kids in school? We ask that they do academic achievement, that they have success in the current system, that they learn the proxy subjects. I say proxy because math is a proxy for logic. Literature is a proxy for human relationships. And we try to get them ready for college or for the work world. That's what we do today. But what should we be asking of our kids? That's the important question. And I think the answer to that is only one answer, improve the world, kids. Don't sit there and get ready to improve the world, but actually improve it. And the reason that's so important is they're already starting. They're already starting without us. Here's some kids in the US, but there are kids that I've seen all over the world who, at all ages, who are ready and willing and actually being active to improve the world. And what they need from us is help in applying their passions. Not just finding their passions, but applying them to improving the world. They need our respect and trust. That's the number one thing that kids ask for in the world. We don't give it to them enough. They need independence from all the curricular stuff that's being put on top of them. And they need for us to believe in them. And this is James Franco, he's a well-known actor. This is his teacher, who is a friend of mine. She showed me I could take my dreams as seriously as I wanted. It's not that she taught me this or that or the other thing or got me to pass the test. She showed me I could take my dreams as seriously as I wanted. Now, kids, young people, have always learned more. They've always been most motivated when they were doing real projects in the real world for real audiences. And I hate the word authentic because that means nothing. It's real audiences. If you write something, there should be somebody out there reading it and giving you feedback and preparing them, really preparing them for the world that they're going to live in. And now, that we have the world at our fingertips, that we have all this technology coming, not to everybody, but soon to everybody. Our kids are not the same people we were when we went to school. That's what's so important to realize. They are people with extended brains. This device, this phone that we all have in our pocket is like a supercomputer from just a few years ago. It lets us do all kinds of things that extend our brains. That's important. And even more important, those extended brains are all networked together. So if you're a teacher and you're looking at the people in your class, what you should be seeing is extended brains all networked together. These kids can do infinitely, infinitely more than they ever could, than kids ever could before. And they can collaborate around the world in new ways. Kids in Singapore. Kindergarten kids can be having kindergarten with kids in New York, in China, in the Middle East, all over the place. They can do that. We don't use that yet. But they're already empowered to. This is me a couple years ago in Kuala Lumpur. And these kids are the same as all kids around the world. They want to do this stuff. They know how to do this stuff. They can act and accomplish and become and build and create and help and fix and improve and inspire and join together and preserve and share and teach and learn in very new ways. So let me give you a few examples. We can have primary school kids mapping the brain because we have this thing called iWire where you can do that. We can have high school kids building supercomputers, putting together all the computers that they have and building in their own school supercomputers. 
We have 12-year-old girls. We saw Iron Man giving a prosthetic device. We could have 12-year-old girls printing these devices. And not only printing the devices, because the instructions are all on the internet, they can find the kids who need them. These are our 12-year-olds, 9-year-olds. They design up water park or whatever you need in your community. They beat out local architects. These are things that actually have happened. 11-year-old is one of the world's top cryptographers, believe it or not. They can do government mandated reports, environmental reports. You don't have to hire a consultant. You can hire your fifth or sixth graders to do these reports. High school kids are restoring our history, restoring historical ships and monuments and things like that. They're testing the local water. It's unbelievable that in a place that doesn't have good water, clean water, or good sanitation, school is not about creating that. It could be. The kids want to do this, or repairing the broken traffic lights after a natural disaster like an earthquake, or producing the videos that show the plight of different groups in different places and minorities. Here's a great example I love. The 16-year-old goes to a restaurant, and he sees the crayons they give to the kids to color. And he said, what do you do with those crayons when you're through? And they say, we throw them away. He said, that's a big waste. So he started a company, and they've collected close to a million crayons and given them to people around the world. This is what kids can do these days. These kids building infrastructure, historical preservation, health care, government, they're all white from my country. They could be from any place. They could be Asian, they could be African, they could be Middle Eastern, because the kids are the same these days. And to serve these kids, we'd better fundamentally change how we think of education, what global education should be. It's not just an academic process anymore. Somehow the academicians got a hold of it. But that's not what education is. That's what I call plan A education. We all went through it. Classrooms, academic instruction, learning, basics, achievement, subject knowledge. We all did that stuff. We all went for individual achievement. That's obsolete. Wouldn't sound like it from some of the things we might hear, but it is. Because we need to be empowering the kids further. The kids are already empowered. They know it. We need to know it and work to empower them further to use their new abilities to add value add value. There's billions of dollars of value our kids could add and improve their local and personal and world communities. That's what kids need to be brought up to do and do it while they are still students. That's a huge change in the world. It's because the kids are now empowered. They want to do this. We have to do this and we need to do it through real world accomplishment. That's the moonshot. That's what we should be going for in the next 10 years, is really getting the kids of Singapore to make Singapore better, of getting the kids in Africa to make Africa better, getting the kids in New York or wherever it is to make their place better. We can do that, and they can do that. And it serves everybody, because nothing builds self-esteem and self-confidence like accomplishment. This is Thomas Carlyle, a Scottish philosopher from a while back. What we're doing today is shortchanging ourselves. We're shortchanging our students, both of us, because we deeply, deeply underestimate what our kids are capable of today and the value that they can bring into the world. We underestimate that. All we do is plan A education. We bring more people in. We add technology. We add STEM. We add 21st century schools. But it's still the old plan A education. Learn now, do later. That's a fundamental error, to think that if we just improve plan A, everything will be great. That's not true. It's not enough. Plan A deeply underestimates what our kids can do today. And so it's time for new perspective. I really want you to leave here thinking differently. It's time to prepare our kids for the future and to fundamentally change what education means. We need a new education. I'm calling it Plan B, so you can remember easily. It goes beyond Plan A to new ends, new means, and a different kind of curriculum to support those ends and means. Not the mess, 
The mess is my shorthand for math, English, science, social studies. No, those are important, but we can't just do those things. We need effective thinking, effective action, effective relationships, and effective accomplishment. That's what we need in the world. That's what our kids need from us. We need to bring back what worked. We used to have an education that was built on accomplishment. It's called apprenticeship. We don't anymore. Now we have an academic education. We have to create the real world, project-based education of the future. We have to produce a generation of kids who improve the world, who improve their personal and their local and their global worlds, and who do it through applying their passion. I love this word, applied passion. It's not just you have to be passionate about something. You have to learn to use that passion to make your world and our world a better place and help our kids become a word that I love, that a friend of mine, Zoe Weil, uses, solutionaries, people who find solutions. Now, the kids are already doing this. They're already doing it on our own. Now, you can see databases, this is one that I set up, of real-world projects. And there are hundreds of these or thousands of these around the world that we can draw on. What we need is a plan B education that has better ends, and those ends are improving our planet, our improving our world, improving our communities. We need better end for the students, which are becoming good, like the Dalai Lama would say, good, effective, and world-improving people. And that's what we have to tell our kids to become, not scholars, not A students, but good, effective, world-improving people. Learning is a means. It's a good means, but it's not the only means, and it's certainly not the goal of education. The goal is becoming good, effective, world-improving people and improving the world. And the means to do that is very simple. It's real-world accomplishment. That's what we have to do. We know how to do it. We've seen a big move to problem-based learning. We heard it in the medical schools. We've heard, we've seen it. We know how to do this stuff, but we have to do it. Real-world projects at school that solve real-world problems. We have to find the problems in the world and the challenges, the needs of the world locally. Look around, ask the kids, what do you see? What problems are there? And then we have to solve them. We have to harness those individual passions of each of the kids and apply them. If you're interested in nature, how do you use your interest in nature to help your community? If you're interested in sports, how do you use your interest in sports to help the community? If you're interested in music, how do you help use your interest in music to help the community and help the world? And so, you leave school, not with grades. Nobody cares about your grades. Well, they do a little bit, but what they really care about if you're an employer is what did you do? Where's your resume of accomplishments, which now you don't have when you leave school, but you could. And then to support this, we need a better curriculum based on thinking plus action, plus relationships, plus accomplishment. Those are four things that we need. We just do a tiny piece of this. And we have to combine them, of course, with knowing about the world, global and local awareness, individual applied passions, but we don't teach any of this stuff. We have this very narrow curriculum. We think it's huge because it takes up the whole lunch and we have all those great diagrams. But what do we do? We teach reading and math and maybe written communication, beyond reading, understanding, writing, research, maybe a little critical thinking, maybe a little scientific thinking, maybe a little citizenship. We don't do much more beyond that. It takes up all our time. But here's what kids really need. They need all these things. And I'm going to go through them just so you, because I know you can't read that. There's so many that just adding the problem solving, the creative thinking, the innovation collaborative, the, the 21st century skills is not nearly enough. You need all of these things. So as I go through these one at a time quickly, I want you to think about a couple of things. One, is this important? Can we leave it out? Do we know about it? And is this something we want in our curriculum? Do we teach it systematically? Problem solving, okay, maybe a little bit. We're getting better at that. Curiosity, questioning, 
creative thinking, but not just creative, design thinking, integrative, systems thinking, financial, we don't do a lot of that, <coughs> inquiry and argument, judgment, transfer, aesthetics, habits of mind, especially the positive mindset of Carol Dweck that's so important, stress control, focus, contemplation, meditation, and what's the very most important self-knowledge of your own passion and strengths. We don't do enough of that stuff. Not systematically. Some teachers do it, of course. That's true. But we don't do it like we do math. Action. Habits of highly effective people. We know those. Believe it or not, there's a book that's been out for 35 years. We don't teach them for the most part. Agility, adaptability, leadership and followership. Experimentation. Decision-making under uncertainty and prudent risk-taking. Kids learn it in their games. They don't learn it in Reality testing, patience, resilience, grit, entrepreneurship, of course, and innovation, improvisation, those are just small pieces of what we know. Ingenuity, strategy, and tactics, breaking barriers, project management, hugely important, programming our powerful machines, video making, innovating with the new technologies coming down the road. That's just the action skills. What about relationships? Collaborating and communicating. Okay, we do sort of one-on-one. -on -one. We're moving a little bit to teams, but what about families and communities and work and online and in virtual worlds and with machines? What about listening and networking, which is a huge skill today? Relationship building and empathy and courage and compassion and tolerance and ethics and politics. Conflict resolution, look what's going on in the world. Even the schools that say they want a more peaceful world don't have courses in conflict resolution. Negotiation, peer-to-peer, -peer, coaching and being coached. We need a new matrix for education, a new way to think about it that's based on these real-world accomplishments. It's not that we want to use these other things to learn math. We want to learn math because it's important for these projects. That's the flip that really we really need. And of course, it's all got to be supported by the powerful technology, because that goes without saying that that's what our world is about. I'm not saying get rid of math and, and language and science and social studies. I'm saying individualize them to fit the applied passions and to fit the projects. Now, more and more people around the world are realizing this that our new and empowered kids need this different Plan B curriculum. And what we need to do, if you believe any of this stuff, and more and more people do, we'd better convince the parents and the teachers and the communities that this is the way to go. Because otherwise, they're going to say, give our same kids what we had. And that's not enough. We have to design and refine and do the things that they're doing in Singapore and other countries to figure out what Plan B education is. And we had better experiment. Now, some of you may have come across this. Don't experiment with my kid, right? I hear it all the time. But the only answer to that is we have to. It would be irresponsible of us not to experiment because our kids live in a never-before-seen context that's very different from the one we grew up in. That's the typewriter that I used in college, ladies and gentlemen. We don't know how to prepare kids for that context yet. We're just learning. We've got to experiment, and we've got to experiment together to create the new education that's not just better for us, but better for the kids. It's better for the kids because they get independence, applied passion, a strong resume of accomplishments, and especially a sense of how they fit into the world and what they can accomplish. It's better for all of us because it liberates this huge human potential that's in our kids that now is sitting in our school's warehouse in the process of learning to do something later. We need to use that now. We need an education that further empowers our already empowered students and that deeply integrates them into helping their local and personal and world communities. And people are starting to do this. This is a superintendent in the United States. Before I approve any project, show me how it helps the community. We need to take back our education from the academics. I love academics, 
but they have captured education. And that's not what it should be. We need to bring forth a new education that produces a new kind of kid, a kid with independence and applied passion and a sense of accomplishment and a sense of fitting into the world and what they're going to do. That's what we have. That's what we need to encourage, basing it on real world accomplishment. We're at the ground floor today of a huge new world to come. Imagination in that world, full of creativity in that world, full of innovation, full of entrepreneurial spirit. Our kids have that. What we need is people who want to empower kids. That's what we have to want to do, not who want to help them teach, learn, or achieve, or do all these things. That stuff is important, but we want, need the people who want to empower them, people who are interested in participating in that process, who want to contribute to that process, who want to be informed about that process. That's the people we need. Hopefully, that's lots of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a huge optimist. Despite everything that I just said, I'm a huge optimist about the future of education because I'm a huge optimist about today's kids. I meet them all over the world. I love them. They're all the same. They're incredibly enthusiastic about their new world that they're coming. And I mean all kids everywhere. I'm talking about all the kids in the world. But we're going to have to create that plan, that plan B education of the future. We're going to have to create it because it doesn't fully exist anywhere. There's no place that I can point you to, whether it's Singapore or Finland or anywhere else, that says, oh, we've got it nailed down. We are all learning to do this. But the good news is that we can do it. <laughs> we can do this. Because the map is here. The map is emerging in the world. All we have to do is see that map and follow it. That map is improving the world, making education about improving the world, locally, globally, personally, improving the world, doing it through the means of real world accomplishments, starting in kindergarten. Yes, those kids could be helping their homes, but they could be watering the plants. They could be doing all sorts of things that would help Singapore, even in kindergarten. And the support is a broader curriculum based on thinking and action and accomplishment and relationships. So let's begin from wherever we are. We're all in different places. We all came from different places. We've all gone through plan A. Let's begin to move from plan A to plan B. Let's begin to move from academic learning and personal achievement to improving the world and real world accomplishment. Let's begin to move from just teaching math and English and science and social studies to teaching effective thinking, effective action, effective relationships, and effective accomplishment. And let's always remember, this is what I'm going to leave you with, there are two most important words that we can say or that any adult can say to a young person today. And I'll give you two seconds to think about what those two words might be, but these are mine. Surprise me. And ladies and gentlemen, they will.